Hey, good morning. Good morning on this beautiful summer morning. How many of you enjoyed that cold air that came in last night? Yeah, that felt good. Felt good. Uh, we're going to get into the Word this morning. Um, I'm Pastor Nate. I'm honored to be here. Uh, sometimes you don't realize how, how thankful you are uh, for the place that God calls you until, you know, it's easy to get comfortable. It's easy to... And I was going over some notes, and um, today's going to be a standalone message, um, and then we're going to be starting something coming up uh, about housekeeping um, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, but today, I'm going to just be talking to us about standing in the gap, and the title of this morning's message is, How We Doing, or How You Doing. I, I was going to say we, but I, sometimes when we say we, sometimes... Um, we think uh, because somebody else is part of, oh, we cleaned this, or oh, we did this, and you didn't really play a part. We sometimes doesn't put the onus on you. And so I wanted to ask you, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Um, how, how, how are you doing? How are you doing? Um, but, and that's the title of this morning's message. But I, I wanted to just, uh, just go, this is an old notebook that I, ha- that I had, and I felt uh, just impressed to pick it up. And I mean, this is, I used to teach out of this years ago. Um, so I got lots of really good notes in here. Um, I say that. I mean, they're uh, messages that were written back, this is 8 9, 19, 2012. So that's, I mean, we're talking pretty good while ago. And, um, Anyway, I went to the beginning of it, and this is, I wanted to just read you uh, some of a devotional time, Um, and I thought it would be good for us here in this moment, especially now that the offering has passed. You've heard it said that we don't date God, right? Don't date God. Pick him up on Sunday, drop him off at home. True. But as we are married, we can't forget to date him, to give him a date where you come just to be with him. You get dressed up, you get ready, prepared to meet him, just to get to know him, to be intimate with him. You set aside the night. You set aside, you make time. You give him your precious seed. You spend that money. How many of you know date night costs at least 100 bucks? I mean, you gotta have 100, you know what I mean, at least. Uh, of maybe that's not necessarily in your budget. You know, you just, if you're married and you're not dating, you need to start dating. This is marriage advice, but this is also God advice. As the bride of Christ, we need to remember to date God. Yeah, you're married, but do we date him? Do we date him? Precious seed, harvest. So he says, uh, bring precious seed, precious harvest. So in tears, reap in joy. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, um, what you're saying in those times, I want all of you. You can have all of me. That's a powerful statement to start with. I want all of you. You can have all of me. How are we doing? How are you doing? This key right here is what do I have that's his? His. What do I have that's his? That's good, Rod. Everything. But I don't think we realize that. You know your time that you have? I don't have. It's his time. You know, you, everything that you have, everything that I have, we are stewards of. But only the only way I'll steward it is if I realize it's not mine. You ever borrow somebody's something? You ever borrow somebody's tractor? You ever borrow somebody's, I don't know, I was going to say snowblower, but probably not. <laughs> maybe, a, maybe it's a drill. Maybe, it, maybe you needed a drill for do some drywall work. I don't know. But you don't, how many of you know that you don't just throw that on the floor while you're spraying the ceilings to, be, to you know, this yellow drill now turns white, and then you give it back to them white? If you do, you're an idiot. And you'll never borrow something again because you're a poor steward. Because you don't recognize the value of what is somebody else's. And as long as in my life I don't recognize the value of what somebody else's, I I won't steward it well. It's okay if my drill gets like that. It's okay if my drill sits out in the rain. I, I don't want that to happen. But I'll tell you what, if I'm borrowing somebody else's drill and I got all my tools sitting out and and I'm borrowing somebody else's drill, and it starts to rain, what gets picked up first? 
That's right. Because it's not mine. So I, how I handle it, it changes. And so there's this, uh, we're going to, we might, we might, um, oh, I don't know if we can go there. We're not, we're not going to go there this morning, but there's a parable of the talents, okay? And so this, there's a principle of these three men that were given something by a master. And they were all given talents. One was given more, and then the next one was given a, a five, two, and, and one. But the report, when, when they came back to the master and they said, look, see, you've given me five, I've made five more. Here's what they said. You have given me five. Now I have five more. That is so key for your and my stewardship, that what I have in my hand, you didn't make it. Hello? Let me, let me ask you how much, how much life you can make of your life. I mean, just a, just a bad, just that quick, that quick, that quick. You can't make what you really want. It's a gift. It's a gift. So this is key. Lord, all, all, all that I have, all that I have, all of me for all of you. So how are we doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? So let's go here. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. And this, is a, um, th- th- this message is about responding to your heart. This is what this message is about. Responding to your heart. Did you know that every person in here, if you're even, even, even if you're not born again, the Bible says that he stands at the door of our heart and knocks. That he would come in. Like it, it, he's, he's, he's beckoning and, and, and looking. Was Paul saved? Or Saul saved, excuse me? But he heard from the Lord, didn't he? Why are you persecuting me? There's, there's, there, we hear, we have to be able to reject him. In order to be able to re- reject something, I have to be able to recognize. Okay? Now, it says, so here, here we are. Um, uh, it, 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 let, let us have the opportunity. It says, therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Let me just pause here. This message is about what am I doing with what I've heard? Like, I'm talking about your heart. I'm talking about your heart. Here's what God does, because the hands and feet of Jesus are all right here. They're right here. Is God's hand shortened? Well, Maybe. Maybe if I'm busy about what I'm doing, maybe, 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 he, and here's what I'm talking about. Uh, full tree fly, don't bother me. Um, man, I got sweaty this morning Whew, in worship. Anyway, sorry, just acknowledging that if you see those pit, pit sweats, all right. <laughs> you're walking down, maybe, maybe you're walking into church and you see somebody. Maybe you don't see that their countenance has fallen. Maybe you do see it's, fa- it's fallen. But the Lord says, hmm, wonder how they're doing. So you see them and you go. Or you walk by and you see somebody in the chair and you, you, you go, I wonder how they're doing. You should check on them. Uh, but I'm busy with my stuff, my time. My Anybody ever have that feeling like, not a, it's not a feeling, it's the voice of the Lord directing the hands, his hands in his feet. So we're talking about what am I doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? Are you, are, are you doing your own thing or how are you doing? How am I? This is a mess. And here's the cool thing is I eat what I cook. How am I doing? How am I doing? What am I doing with with the words of the Lord to me? He says this. He says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Do good to all people. How are you doing? When you ask somebody, how are you doing? What do they usually say? Good. How are you doing? Good. Sometimes they give you, maybe it's something else, right? But how are you doing? Especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Did you know the family of believers, who you're called to, he said, this is especially, we should be doing good. Right. Now, we're going to look at that here in just a moment. Um, let's go to John chapter 13, uh, 34 through 35. John, it says, a new commandment I give unto you, 
There's a commandment that was a new commandment that Jesus gave, and he said, love one another or do good. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. How did Jesus love them? This is huge. Like just looking at how did Jesus, how did Jesus love? What did he give? Did he feed them? Did he go to them? Did he wait at a well in the middle of the hot day when he probably had something else he could be doing? Was he about his time or was he about his father's business? His father's business because he was a steward. It was his father's business. See, you and I were called to our father's business. And you know what we found when he was about his father's business? He's about people. And this new commandment he gives to one of us, he says, love one another as I love you. So you must love one another. Verse 34, this is the, or 35, this is the key to other people finding the love of God. Right here, look at this. It says, by this everyone will know, not just the church, not just other believers, but everyone will know you are my disciples if you what? Well, there's something about loving one another. There's something about not just telling you what I know, but a- a- acting on and, ex- a- and, and when the Lord speaks to my heart or when, the, when a prompt comes, I do something with it. How are you doing? What am I doing with, what, with those, those prompts? Well, let me get, go to this passage and then we're going to spend the rest of this morning in Nehemiah. Okay? So, but first I want to go here in Matthew chapter um, 25. Matthew 25. 14 through 22. Uh, No, let's go here. Um, Let's go to, oh, I didn't put it in there. Let's go to, it's probably Luke 10. Let me me go here. Um, Oh, no, here. Let's go right here. I I know I had a note here with that verse. Luke 10, 25 through 37. Did I already go there? It's on my notes here. Luke 10, 25 to 37. You've maybe heard this, but don't hear it like you've heard it. Hear it again. All right. So <clears throat> this is, um, we just read this new commandment. Uh, in the, the, there's this, this, this Pharisee that's basically saying, hey, I want to I, I test Jesus. I want to stump Jesus. I want to make Jesus look silly. All right. Um, and so there's expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he answers, uh, what is written in the law, Jesus said. And how do, you, how do you read it, he replied. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart. So Jesus isn't saying this. This is the, the expert of the law. The, the expert of the law says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And, and he added this next one. He's like, this, what we just read, there's this new law. Love your neighbor. As yourself. Well, so next verse. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you'll live. He, that Good answer. Do this and you'll live. And then the, the, the next verse says, uh, the, 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 the expert decided to stump, stump Jesus and say, well, tell me who's the neighbor? Who's the neighbor? And this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Next verse. We're just going to read through it. In, in, uh, in reply, Jesus said, a man, was going, a, man, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Robbers. So somebody wanted what you had. Somebody wanted what somebody else had, right? It says a priest happened by, to, so the pastor, Okay. A pastor happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. He, had, he was happened down the road. He was about the father's business, right? He needed to get to church. He was late for a counseling appointment. So too, the worship leader, that's what a Levite is, somebody that helps in the, okay? So too, the worship leader, when he came to the place and he saw the man, he said, well, we got practice Passed on the other side. Next verse. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went, in, he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. He brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out 
some money and gave them to the innkeeper. He said, look after him, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any expense you might have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do thee likewise. Wow. How are we doing? How are we doing? You know, the only difference between, there, there, there's, besides, the, uh, besides the man that was beaten, uh, there's four other people in this story. There's a robber. There's a priest and a Levite, and, and then there's a Samaritan. And the priest and the Levite said, what's mine is mine. What's mine is mine. The robber said, what's yours is mine. But the Samaritan said, what's mine is yours. Wow. That's so different than what we live in America. That's so different than what we, this is why I can get a prompt. I can, I can think, oh, I can think. I just thought of somebody. I just had this thought. I wonder how they're doing. Yeah, you just thought of that out of the blue. No. Check on them. Check on them. Oh, don't, but checking on them is one thing. Oh, praying. Okay. How about um, some money for the inn? How about your mule? How's your mule doing? Do they need, do they need your mule? This is love. This is, and again, we're going back, let's go back. Especially, do good to all, but especially your brothers and sisters and moms and dads. This is believers. So, Let's go to Nehemiah. We're going to spend our time in Nehemiah this morning. <clears throat> and I think there's a, uh, some really good principles here. Um, and I, 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 just, I just think there's just, just a lot of good here. Okay? Um, Nehemiah chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, you, you can, we will be in Nehemiah 1 through probably 4 mostly. Um, and you get your markers ready, your highlighters ready, whatever you want to get ready. Um, it'll be helpful. It says, starting in verse 1 of chapter 1, these are the words of Nehemiah, son of, I can't pronounce that name, Hekeliah, Hekeliah. In the month of Chislev, in the twelfth year, while I was in Citadel of Susa. So here he is making this letter about, these are my words, Nehemiah's words. I was in this city, in this place, and what happened was, um, my brothers came to me. So look at this. In the month I was, I was at this place, and my brothers arrived. Next verse. Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. So he's like saying, hey, I, I, I was at the Memorial Day picnic, or hey, I was, where, I was at Walmart, or hey, I was at wherever you were at. A brother came to me. Somebody that I knew and I saw. Have you ever been there where you are out to, maybe you went to Andy's ice cream and you're ordering and all of a sudden there walks up Lance Harless. Hey man, what's up? And there was my brother. And I questioned them. You know what I said? Hey, how's, uh, how's, how's that guy doing? Hadn't seen him in a bit. You know, that guy that was... Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. This is what, you ever been there? Have you ever been there where you, you meet your brother and then you, what are you asking about? Your other brothers. You ever ask about your other brothers? This would be a good place to start. Am I asking about my other brothers? This is what's happening here. He, one of his brothers came from Judah and some other men and he questioned them. I, I questioned them. Nehemiah questioned about the Jewish remnant or his brothers, his sisters, his aunts, his uncles, his cousins, his family would be the word, better word, his family uh, that had survived the exile also about Jerusalem. So he said, hey, how's everybody doing? Are, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, are they well? What, what's going on? Next verse. They said to me, well, those who survived the exile are back in the province, but they're in great trouble. In disgrace, the walls of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. They've been burned with fire. <clears throat> when I heard these words, 
I sat down and I wept. And I mourned for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. When I heard these words, I was like, oh, man, praying. Then I said, verse 5, then I said, and he begins to pray. He begins to pray. It actually says not just then. It said he fasted and prayed. He said for days, mourned for days. Jump into verse, uh, jump into verse 8. He says this, remember, he's talking to the Lord, remember I pray the word that you commanded. This is key right here. When, when, when the Lord brings you somebody, remember to pray the word that he's commanded. Now I want to pause, and I didn't give you this verse, I want to, I want to go here. Joshua chapter 5, and jo- Joshua 5.14, I'll give you two verses Joshua 5, 14, and Joshua 10, 12 through 14. So we're talking about how, how am I doing? How, what am I doing with when the Lord comes to me? Am I, am I, and when I, when I happen by somebody that's hurting, my brother or sister, when it comes to me, if my steps are ordered to the Lord and it comes to me, what am I doing when it comes to me? We see that Nehemiah asked, asked about him, and then he, there, was, there was movement going on. He had a response, right? We're going to start here by, number one, praying the word, okay? Not manipulative prayers, not praying sides. Right here. Remember the instruction, uh, excuse me, um, sorry. Go, did I already give it to you, Joshua 10, 14? Or did I give you Josh? Joshua 5, 14 and 10, 12 through 14. Joshua 5, 14 and Joshua 10, 12 through 14. So this is this passage when Joshua is about to go into the, uh, into, the, the, um, into the promised land and he's about to take over the, the first city, which is the big walled city, Jericho. And so he's out and about and uh, kind of sca- you know, kind of sizing up the city, getting direction, all that. And as he's out in the wilderness, uh, there, there, there's this, he sees this man, and this man has his sword drawn. And he, he's like, hey, hey, hey. And I really, I should have went to verse 13 too. And he says this, he says, Joshua says to him, hey, are you for us or are you against us? And here's what this man says. He says, neither, but I'm a commander. I am the commander of the Lord's army I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. I have now come. Then Joshua fell down on the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? Now, I, I, I believe that this was a pre-incarnate Jesus. That's what I, I believe. He, he fell down. This translation, NIV, it doesn't read it like the other ones where it says, he goes on to say, take off your shoes because you're on holy ground. But the fact that he says he saw a man, Right, and the fact that he said he's a commander, and we know Jesus is the commander or the prince of peace. The prince is, was always over the army of the king, and so he comes. He comes outside, and his sword is drawn, and he tells him this: the sword representing really uh, how, what he wars with, and he wars with his words. You see this in Revelation: who is worthy to open the book? The Lamb. So I just believe that. I mean, you want to, you could call that God. You could call it an angel, but it was a man. Okay. And so he comes out and he says, "Who are you with?" Joshua said, "Whose side are you on? Have you ever had something come to you and you you're supposed to pick sides? No, you're not supposed to pick sides." You're supposed to come under the command of the Lord. This is when, when the Lord, when you, when some, when God brings you down, uh, down the road, and you see the person lying there robbed, or you, you see somebody in need of tending in some way. What is my response, Lord? What do you say? That's my response. My response is to not only that, but to pray the word. To pray the word. Because what will happen is, go, let's go to the, uh, the other one, Joshua 10. What will happen is, if you and I will come under God's word, we'll be able to see more than what we're capable of doing ourselves. So this is the same, uh, this is again the, the same book, Joshua. These are stories when, when the Lord 
But he said, you're going to come under my command. He said, I'm not on your side. You're, not, I'm, I, you're coming under my command. Okay? This is the angel of the Lord. All right? And he's like, all of these cities that were won, all of this land that they walked in, the Lord fought the battle for the Israelites. Okay? Now, on the day that the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of that word, Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jazar, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about, half, about a full day. Next verse. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Here's what happened is a man came into alignment with the Lord and said, Lord, stick, I want to stick with your plan. You told me, this is the story, you told me to, to take the whole place out, to take all of these, the, the, this army out, but it's getting night. The night's beginning to come, and they're going to flee to the hills, and I won't be able to finish the job. Make the sun stand still so I can finish the job. Stick with the plan. Here's what happens when you and I pray the word, because this is what Nehemiah did. He said, remember, I'm going to pray the word, Lord. I, I'm praying the word. What happens is when I stick to the plan, I can get more than what a man can do. Amen. Stick to the word. We, we, we're settling for we're settling for so much, we're letting the robber rob and run away with all the stuff because we're not sticking to the word. We, we, we approach and we pray things because of how we see something instead of saying, Lord, what do you say? We approach and pray things and we'll take, we'll take somebody's side and somebody else's side and you don't know anything except for what he says. If the Lord brought it to you, then ask him what he wants you to do with it. And, and here's the deal. If the Lord brings it to you, then there's provision for whatever he directs you to do. The words that are going to come out of your mouth. Well, I don't know what to say, and I don't know what to do, and I don't know. No, 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 no. He found you. He found you, mighty man of valor, Gideon. If God finds you, if, he, if, if it's brought to your attention, then it's within what God wants. to. He, he'll, he'll flow through you. Eloquence is ridiculous. Power is what we need. Uh, just being eloquent and being like, well, I just, uh, I want to give you a, a you know, uh, forget that. Hey, snotty nose, teary eyes, I don't care. Pit stains. When you get it, go. When you get it, do something. Ask about them. Again, we're talking about how are you doing? What are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? So Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 8. He said, pray, remember, I pray the word. He's talking to the Lord. I pray the word that you commanded. Your servant Moses, when you said, this is verse 8, when you said, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But you, But if you return to me and keep... And keep and practice my commands that even in your exile, that, that even if your exiles have been banished to the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as my dwelling place for my name. So he's saying, Lord, I'm reminding you of your word. Even if, if we've left you and we've been scattered, we, I see that we've been scattered. I know that we've missed it. I know that there's, there, the enemy has been in. I know that there, we've made mistakes. But I'm appealing to you in your word and your mercy. And you said you would draw them back. You said you could restore. You said you'd bring them to here. This is powerful. Amen. But if you return to me and keep my practices, my commandments, then even if your exiles have been banished to the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling place for my name. Verse 10. There are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and mighty hand. Hope for it's not too late. See, when you stick with the plan, there's hope. When you stick with the word, there's hope. But when I look at everything that I see, there's, it's hopeless. Chapter 2, verse 1. I thought this was so good. Now, in the month of Nisan, or let me put it this way, three months later, 
three months later. Let that sink in for a second. I asked about John. Man, that's so bad. I feel so terrible. Uh, No, no, three months later, he's still about John, his family. You know, it wasn't John. I'm using this as an analogy. Are you sticking with me? Are you tracking with me? Three months later, after the Lord brought, after he he saw that guy and, and he was checking on that family, three months later, he's still checking on the family. Pastor's still checking on the family. You're going to see that this isn't past just, uh, uh, this isn't a message for pastor. You're going to see this here in a moment. You're going to see, and next to him, and next to him, and next to him, and next to him. You had Amy, and next to him, you had the Montgomery's, and next to him, right? I mean, you might as well start now. To him, you had the Schlegels, and you had the Johnsons, next to him. And next to him, and next to him, and next to him. They were all building. They were all working. Three months later, three months later in the 20th year of King, uh, I don't want to even say that word. Let's go to the next one. Uh, let's go. Um, oh, go ahead. Y'all can, y'all can, Art, 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 I don't know. Yep. King Art. When wine was set before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. And I had never been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, why is your face sad? So this is Nehemiah bringing the, bringing the king wine. And the king says, why is your face sad? Though you are not ill, this could only be sadness of the heart. Hmm. When the Lord puts somebody on your heart. Three months later, he said, I was overwhelmed with fear with the king. In other words, like, ah, uh, should I tell him? I replied, may the king live forever. Why should I not be sad when the city my fathers are buried, are, where they're buried, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Why should I not be sad? Why should it not affect me? If one part of the body suffers, then I suffer. Yeah. Well, this sounds New Testament, doesn't it? Why should, I, why should I, my heart not hurt for my family? Well, my heart doesn't hurt for my family because I'm good. Because what's mine is mine, and I mean, I'm good. I'm good. What happens when somebody goes to the hospital? Oh, well, pastor will take care of that. Oh, don't worry. The, uh, they, they, they'll send them a plant or something, and I'm sure they'll pray for them, maybe. I mean, I know they'll, they'll get the text. If they, if they find out about it in a way that was other than Facebook that manipulates your feed to where you don't even see what's actually going on with the people that you like because they tell you. Like Facebook's the worst way of communication for the church, period. It's called, hey. Shoot somebody a, t- a phone call or a text. Not a post about it on Facebook and all my friends will know about it. No, you know, I, most of you, I, I, first of all, I'm not even on Facebook other than Marketplace, which I need to get off of. But if I do, if I do see, I don't know if anybody here is on Facebook, but I don't see 99% of any of the people here. I see people that I don't even know who they are, but somehow I'm friends with them. You know what I'm saying? And then like a week later you see, uh, oh, somebody had a birthday. Oh, oh, well, happy birthday. All right, let's keep going here. So he said, why should I not be sad? Verse, uh, this is verse 3. He said, where my, where my fathers are buried lies in the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Verse 4. What is your request? The king replied. So I prayed to the God of heaven and answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send somebody else to go to Judah. I ask that you would send money. I ask that you would. Well, I'm busy right now. I, don't you know I got that thing coming up? I, if I found favor in your sight, could you send your army? Could you send me? Have you ever heard that before? Here am I, Lord. Send me. That's a good place to be, isn't it? 
Lord, send me. Send me. This is your time. I'm on your time and I'm on your dollar. I'm on your time and I'm on your dollar. You know this offering declaration? It, we've been doing it probably for, gosh, probably six, six months now. I was driving in, the, in my truck and I felt like the Lord was saying, you need to be saying some stuff during offering and not just about what you're about, but it be about what I'm about. Because when you're about what I'm about, you'll be well taken care of. Our lives will bring increase to your kingdom. In no way will we be limited to serve our generation. That's what it's about. Period. Either you're going to work, we're working on right now what will last forever or what will burn. Let's keep going here. What is your request? So he, he said, I, I, uh, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in, in, in your eyes, I ask that you would send me to Judah, to the city where my fathers are buried, so that I may build it. So he's, this is a, a powerful thing. His heart is towards his brothers. His time is towards his brothers. He knows that it's his responsibility, that the Lord brought it to him because he wants him to do something. You, you ran into them because he wants you to do something. He, he showed you so he could work through you. Your fulfillment could be had because you would function for what you and I were created for. What are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? He goes on to say this. He says, um, uh, verse 6, Then the king, uh, verse 6, it says, With the queen seated beside him, asked him, How long will this journey take, and what will, uh, when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set a time. And then I also said, if it pleases the king, may letters be given to me for the governors west of the Euphrates so that they will grant me safe passage until I reach Judah. And may I also have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, that he would give me the timber to make the beams for the gates and, the, uh, and for the citadel to the temple, uh, for the city wall and for the house I will occupy. Hey, you know what he's doing? Asking big. Asking big. Listen, when the Lord brings something to you, he, he, he wants you to ask big. Stick with the plan. Lord, what do you want me to do? I want you to go there. Okay, I want, I'm supposed to go there. Well, what do you want me to do? I want you to build the, 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 the walls back up, and I want you to put the gates back up, and I want you to do this. Lord, you know that's going to cost a lot of money. What, what do you want me to do? Ask for it. Okay, like ask the king? Like the king? Like You're not supposed to talk in the presence of the king. Wow, it's pretty powerful. When God lays somebody on your heart, there's provision. Look at what it says. The end of verse 8. And because the gracious hand of God was upon me, the king granted my request. Because I was partnering with the hand of God, there was favor. There was provision. There was what, what Landon was talking about earlier. There was what you could only dream of available. And you didn't have to scheme. You didn't have to come up a way to save enough money to get the timber, to get to this, to do this. And if I could do all this in two weeks vacation, you know, off from the king. You know, like, I, I mean, you can't ask for six months off. I mean, I am the king's cupbearer after all. He, you know. He says, uh, I, I need time to go do this and send me, and I need timber, and I need this, and I need help. And the king, he says, because the Lord, hand of the Lord was upon me, the king granted my request. He actually not only granted his request, he sent with him an entourage. Not just the timber, but an army and help. Pretty powerful. And provisions for him as a cupbearer as one of the kings who's going now on behalf as a governor to, to this city, he's, he now has, the, not only, he has the, the food of the king with him. He has the, all these provisions. It's powerful. Of the king. So, 
He arrives, I'll give you a little back, uh, backlog. He arrives uh, later in this chapter, and, uh, and once he gets to the city, he goes kind of at night with a couple of men. He hadn't told everybody what he's about to do or why he came, and he goes just with his donkey and a couple of men, and he inspects the walls. He, see, he goes to see if it is as his brothers had told him. And after he inspects the walls, uh, the people said, well, the governor was here, but where did he go? And they were looking for him. And so here it says, uh, verse 16, the officials did not know where he, I had gone or what I was doing, for I had not yet told the priest, the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials of any or any other workers. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned down. Come, let us rebuild the wall. Of Jerusalem, so that we will no longer be a disgrace. So they're like, uh, we've been here. The wall, like, it's a big job. It's such a big job that it's like impossible to do. And but here's what he says, verse 18. But I told them about the gracious hand of God that was upon me. I told them about the favor that I had. Let me tell you, when somebody has been in a place of dilapidation and their walls are falling down, would you testify of the gracious hand of God in your life? Because what what has he done for you? Because, see, you know, sometimes you can't, somebody's walls are broken, crumbled, burned to a crisp. There's no rebuilding that with what's there. Well, testify of God's gracious hand. Show them how he's been so good. Look at I got the timber. Look at I got to this. Look at how God's been. Look at what I, I'm here for you. What I have is yours. Oh, you're sounding like, like don't you know? Here's, here's why what I, what I, what's mine is mine. Because I have need. When, I, when all I think of is my need, I can't, what, mine is not yours because of my need. My need is what keeps me from, from being about. This is why even we're talking about directing our lives into a place of overflow. Not just saying, Lord, let me, let me eat more. Let me eat more. Let me get my belly bigger. Just give me some more. Give me some more because I want to eat more. But I told them about the gracious hand of God that was upon me and what the king had said to me. You know what they said? Next verse. Let's start building. Wow. Somebody coming to them. Somebody coming to them. Nothing's happened yet other than they've given a good report to them about God's favor on their life. And you know what they said? All right, let's build. Let's, let's see what God can do. Did you hear me? Let's see what God can do. Let's see what God can do. All right, let's, here's what they said. Let's start building. But then, they, then it says that they mocked us and ridiculed us. But I, Nehemiah, answered in verse 20 to them and said, the God of heaven is the one who's going to grant this success. I came to you not with the plan of a man. I came to you not with enticing words. I came to you with God's word. And I came to you testifying of his goodness and not my scheming, but what he produced in what, how he's good he's been. And guess what? We can build. We can build. And guess who's going to bring it about? God's going to bring it about. It's too burnt. It's too this. It's too that. No, no, no. When you hear, when you testify, what happens is that it's like you can hear God say it, and I'll do it again. This is what a testimony, and I'll do it again. He's not a respecter of persons, and I'll do it again. He'll restore it, and I'll do it again. And it was that, but yeah, but it looks like, but I'll do it again. This is the God that we serve. Or do you think that you're, you, we, we have too big of an estimation of ourselves and what somebody else has, has done to, to limit God and his ability? You know, one of the things that I hear um, and that, that I've heard over and over lately yeah, but God's got to work with their will to bring about his will. Mm-hmm. But you've you surrendered your will because you're so good and your, your, your will's in line with his will because you're so great or because God got you. 
if God can get you, he can get them. You know how he came to you? While you and I were yet sinners. If he could get you, somebody say, if he can get me, he can get them. If he can get me, he can get them. Is God's hand shortened? It's only shortened when I shorten it. When I don't come under his word as a body and a believer, and I'm supposed to be under his command, but it's too big. I'm not going to come under his word because of what I see. That will shorten the hand of God. And you know what? People won't see Jesus on this earth because I don't love them. I love me. And I'm, not, I'm too afraid to pray a sun stand still prayer because I might look like the idiot. Somebody, need, people are all over are saying, would God show up? You know how he used to show up? With you. With you and his word and his time and his provisions. I never asked you to pay for it. I asked him to. He never, the, the, the walls that were falling down, it wasn't his responsibility to build the walls and buy the timber. It was the Lord who brought it to you. Lord, I'm trusting you. Yes. All right. Thank you, Lord. Let us start building, they said. And they answered, the God of heaven is the one who's going to grant us success. All right. So here we go. Um, it's chapter three. This is what I wanted to get to, and we're gonna we're gonna go to five things that keep us from building. Five key five things that keep you and I from going to our friends, from checking on them, from whatever it might be. Okay, so chapter three. It says that the this is the start of chapter three, three verse one. At the sheep gate again, they said, "Let's build." It says uh, this guy, the high priest, and his fellow priests began rebuilding. They dedicated it and installed the doors. After building as far as the tower. Of the hundred and the tower of Hanel, they dedicated the wall. Then the men of Jericho built next to this guy. Let me say it this way. All these different names, I'm going to say it like this. Then um, the men of Jericho built next to the Costillos. And then next to uh, the Nowikis, uh, there was building going on uh, next to the Parkers. And next to the Morrises, there was building going on next to the Parkers. And then next to the Parkers, there was building going on next to the Dickies. And next to the Dickies, there was building on. There, all, this is what's going on. This whole chapter, all it says is, these people were building. They said, we'll build. And then next to them, these people built. And then next to them. And there's just this, this list it starts at this gate, and it goes all the way around the whole city. And what you hear is next to, and next to them, and next to them, and next to them. And it goes all the way through this whole chapter, all those that were built. But again, we're talking about five reasons we don't build, and, we don't, and the hand of God is shortened to the people of God. Number one reason. The number one reason is you might be a noble. In verse 5, it says, Next to him, the, <clears throat> the Tekoites, or let's just say the Hatmans, the Hatmans made repaired next to them. But the nobles did not put their shoulder to the work under their supervisors. What's a noble? Somebody, help me out. What's a noble? A noble person? Well, they would be a person of prominence. The nobles in this time, if you were to read on, they were actually the ones that were taxing the people in the walled cities that were broken down. They were the ones that had the money. They had the wine. They had the provision. They had everything that they need. So you know what? I'm good. I'm good. Don't trouble me with your troubles. Don't trouble me with your troubles. This is one of the number, this is one of the number one, this is the first one we see here, why, why there's not building going on. When, again, the walls have been fallen down, the gates had been burned, and what, what that means is that the enemy could come in freely. 
And when you see and you hear about in somebody's life where the walls have been fall, have fell, fallen or the gates have been burned, then what you know is this, that the enemy can come in freely. If you can see that the enemy's coming in freely, then, then guess what? And you can see it. Then you have a responsibility to build next to them. And you might need to get somebody else and say, hey, will you build next to me? And when you build next to me, and when you build next to me, we're not trying to choose sides. We're going to put up the wall. That's what we're here for, to put up the wall. But it says the nobles, it says that the nobles, uh, they, didn't, they didn't build. They did not put their shoulder to the work, or that's verse 5, to work under their supervisors. <laughs> Why? Because somebody put somebody over them, and nobody's going to be over me. I love verse 12, and it says, And next to them, <laughs> uh, this, 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 these people... The half district made repairs with the help of their daughters. So even the women, even the ladies, even the daughters were out there helping. I think that's powerful. Let's go to chapter four. This is where we're going to start or the next piece. So nobles, number one. I'm good. You're good. Are you good? Do you got everything you need to take care of your life? Great. I'm glad you have enough money to take care of your life. I'm glad you have enough time. Because when you get that report, don't call me to pray for you. Don't call me. Your hands shortened, so is mine. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. Hello? This is, is this the word? This is how they're going to they're gonna know him, by our love for one another. We're not on the same team. If you were to keep reading in, the, in, in Nehemiah, you know what you'd find? It says that Nehemiah rebuked the nobles. And he said, you're getting rich while these people are working. You need to repent and you need to pay back all that was given to you. And you know what they did? They repented. And they, they gave the provisions back. And the, and the lands that they were taking, they gave the lands back. It was like a year of jubilee. Like God had been laying up and these people had been paying. And so God had these nobles the whole time for what? To bring about his purpose. It's never too late to get in on what God's doing. When you think about it, though, so many times we think we're good until we're not. We think we're good until we're not. Let me tell you, if the body hurts, you're hurting. That's my body. Those are my people. That's my family. That's, we got to think this way. This is a shift. How you... How you doing? How you doing? Chapter 4. Now, um, <clears throat> Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, and he was furious, filled with indignation. This is number two. So he ridiculed them. He ridiculed them. I can't believe you're praying for them that way. I can't believe you're doing that. I can't believe you gave them that, that money. I can't believe you. Don't you know that they're just an addict, and they're just going to waste it? Don't you know that blah, blah, blah? Don't you know, oh, I've already tried that with them. There's no hope for them. Yeah, that's what the plan says. That's what this says. There's no hope for you. Once, once, always. God can't redeem that or break. So he ridiculed the Jews before his associates. You know what they did? They told their friends. They told their friends. And the army of Samaria is saying, what are these feeble Jews doing? Can they, can they restore the wall by themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they compete, complete this in a day? Can they, they bring these stones back to life from the mounds of the rubble? No. What was the response? The Lord's going to do this. Could you stand with somebody? How long are you willing to stand with somebody that's naked? Hurting. Are you willing to stay with them at the end for a moment and put them up? Or you just say, well, I tried. See ya. I'm good. I don't want mine. I don't want that on me. It's on you. Can I help you? It's on you. You're accountable, just like the priest and just like the, or just like the pastor and just like the worship leader. It's on you. Next to them, and next to them, and next to them, and next to them, and next to them. It's on you, Matt. It's on you. 
Think about that. Oh, yeah, I'm talking about school, too. It doesn't start when you turn 18. So they were ridiculed. That's, one, that's the number two reason. Number one, noble. Number two, the words of others held higher words or were held in higher regard than the words of God. Ridicule only works when the words of others are held in higher regard than the word of God. It goes on to say, um, verse 3, it says, So, <clears throat> I think it's how you say it, Tobia the Ammonite, who was besides him, said, even, this is, this is number three, okay? So we got ridic- nobles, we got ridicule. Number three is this, unqualified. This is a big one. You feel unqualified to help. You look at what you, your skills, maybe what you know in your knowledge of the word. You look at what you have and all I have is two loaves and a fish. What are these among so many? I'll just eat these. All I have is a meal of oil or a measure of meal and some oil. I'm just going to die with this. I can't do anything. No, no, no. What do you do when you feel unqualified? You bring it to God and say, Lord, you said. Lord, you said. But you feel unqualified. Here's what they say. Um, Who was beside them said, even if even a fox were to climb up what they are building, it would break down their walls of stone. What you're trying to do, you're so worthless. What you do is crud, junk, trash. You ever felt like that? What you're trying to do and help, it's just all going to crumble anyway. You're unqualified. You're standing on the word of God. That's not the word of God. Critic, critic, critic. Critic, critic, critic. Unqualified according to who? It's the Bible says it's the Lord who qualifies. It's the Lord who raises up and sits down. If the Lord brought it to you, he must want to use you. And you know what you could do? You could dream instead of scheme. Dream with somebody. Dream with somebody. I know I had just shared this on Wednesday night. We, we had a dream. My, my, my youngest, or my middle boy, Samuel, had a dream to get a dog after our dog had left. It had swam away in the creek or somebody had taken it. This is years ago. So for over a month, every night, he would pray for a dog to come, our, our dog to come back. And I said, buddy, why don't you just pray that God will give you another dog? So he'd pray that God will give him a dog. And finally one night I thought, God, I wish you would just give up and quit on this, you know, and I'll just go get you a dog. Just pray. And, and that night, I remember hearing him pray, Lord, I thank you for a dog. And that next day, my wife calls me. She said, hey, guess what? I go, a dog showed up? And she's like, yeah, how'd you know? I said, I was, when I told him that, I just, in my heart, heard so clear, you watch, I'm going to do this. And you won't, you're not going to do it. Because as a dad, I was going to get him a dog. You know, I was going to help God out. I mean, my kid's been praying for like a month. He's four or five years old. I mean, I have a heart as a man for my son. You think he might have a you haven't answered a prayer yet? We, where's where's the dog, God? Hey, just pray for another dog. I'll go get the dog. We'll make it work out. All right, I got this. I'm God. So the next day, the dog shows up. His name's Doug. We named him Doug. He hops in. He's at the mailbox at the end of the driveway on the way to school and. And, uh, and my, Samuel says, Mom, my dog, my dog, my dog. And so Evan says, well, um, buddy, uh, and it looked mangy and just terrible. Um, and she said, you know what, buddy, if he's there when we get back from school at the end of this driveway, then, then, we'll, then we'll get him. And guess who was there sitting at the mailbox? At the, this dog just sitting there. She opens up the back hatch. The boy stay in the car. Opens up the back hatch, and he jumps into the back of the Suburban and like it's, he's home, he comes, when she opens it up, when we get home, he runs up the steps and just waits on his hind legs to go in the house, just covered in mat, mats and ticks and just, yeah. And they named him Doug, like, you know, like Doug in the dirt, Doug. <laughs> but we named him Doug, like D-O-U-G, D, yeah. So that was a, that was a dream, wasn't it? 
It was a dream. God does dreams. And then, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I didn't think I'd even be sharing this today. But so then um, so we had to put Doug down on this last week. So it had been like 14 years or 12 years. He's 14 years old. He just wasn't the same anymore. So um, he was struggling in a lot of ways. So anyway, uh, so we had to put him down. And I remember thinking, and you, you're gonna, I'm just going to tell you how it is, all right? I was like, I'll take care of the dog, okay? And, you know, everybody here is like, oh. Some guys are like, yeah, I understand. You know, you had to shoot your horse. You know, this is what you did back in the day, right? And so I was just going to put it in a different compartment of my mind, right? And just take care of it and go, you know. Um, but the family dog wasn't a good idea. We're going to let somebody else kill him for us. This is, you know, I mean, this is, this really, this is real. So I'm like, okay, I'll take him to the vet, and we'll get him put down, get him um, put down. And, I, and while I sat there, it took way longer than I had anticipated. You know how sometimes you can just get something hard over with quick? And then you don't really, but here I sat 30 minutes, 40 minutes with holding a shaking dog. And I was thinking about the promises of God and how I'm holding a promise, you know? And it just began to kind of make me, you know, get a little bit like emotional about a dog that I never thought I'd even really be emotional about because it was a promise. It wasn't a dog. It was what God did, not what I did. And as I sat there, because <clears throat> I told my, my boys that we would bury the dog, you know, on, on our new place. And uh, I just heard in my heart, he said, the Lord just said, go get some rocks from the other place that I gave you. The other thing that I gave you. And so we went up on the hill, which we're, I'm not prepared to talk about. Just some things coming up. Uh, you know, that's, anyway, the hill up across from Hilltop that was given to the church. That's a dream. Yeah. Wasn't scheming. It was God. God did it. God used a man. God had a plan. God did a dream. And we took those rocks from that dream, and we laid them on that dream and put them under a deer stand where you can come up here. I told the kids, I said, you can come up here, not to shoot a deer, but just if you've got to be reminded of God's promises. All of his promises are yes, and they're amen. amen. Sometimes we're, we get so um, overwhelmed by seeing things that we forget that God does the miracles. You just got to be reminded of the miracles. And I just want to remind you that you don't have to be qualified. God does miracles. He'll use a Gideon to be the mighty man of valor. He'll, he'll take a little boy's lunch to feed the thousands. He'll take anyone that just says, hear my Lord, send me. And not, not and exchange their nobility for a shovel. And, and, and not ridicule or be worried about other, what other people say because somebody's hurting. To not worry about their qualifications, but instead say, Lord, you found me. You must, you must have thought I was, I was the one. And then it goes on to say this. I'll wrap up with this. Verse uh, 6. So we built the wall until all of it was joined together up to half its height. I'm here to tell you this is one of the reasons we stopped building. Because it only comes halfway. You ever been there? You stood. You believed. And guess what? Halfway. Halfway, it says up to, uh, up to half its height for the, for the people had a mind to work. So they got it halfway, and I, I love that. They got it halfway, and in, in their mind, they were strong, and they got it to the place where this is as far as I can go. They had a mind to work. Verse 9, it says, So we prayed to God to post a guard against them day and night. Meanwhile, the people of Judah said, Again, this is the part. It's, it's up to half its height. Meanwhile, the people of Judah said, this is again number four. It's getting hard. It's only halfway. Verse 10, the strength of our labor fails, and there is so much rubble that we will never be able to build the wall. So now it's no longer the outside. It's the inside. So there was outsiders that were critiquing. That It was the, the other's words that were... Uh, you were, 
being unqualified. But now I've let the unqualified, somebody else's words now become my words. And now my words uh, can, can move to the place of now it's only come this far. It's only halfway. And, and not only is it only halfway, but I'm getting tired. I'm getting tired of standing. I'm, I'm just, you're just wearing me out. I can tell you I've been there. You're just wearing me out. There's so much rubble, just garbage everywhere that we'll never be able to rebuild the wall. This is what's coming out or being spoken within. There's no hope. According to who? And then fear sets in. So it's hard. The last one was fear. Verse 11, and our enemy said, and our enemy said, so not only am I tired, not only have we only come halfway when we had all this strength and we had all the beginning, the juice to go, our enemy said, before they know or see a thing, we were going to come. We're going to come when you're not looking, they said, and you're missed and we're going to kill you and we're going to put an end to your work. Fear. Fear will keep you from building. Verse 14, this is Nehemiah. After I had made an inspection, I stood up and I said to the nobles, to the officials, and to the rest of the people. I said to those that weren't working yet. I said to those, to the rest of the people that were saying it's too hard. I said to all the people that say, you say we're unqualified. You say our work is junk. You say this. I stood up. That's what he says. I stood up and I said, do not be afraid of them, but remember this, the Lord who is great and awesome. I love this. Remember the Lord is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Fight for your brothers. When you're tired, here's what he said. Remember the Lord is great and awesome and fight for your family. Fight for your family, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Verse 18 says, and each of the builders worked on the wall with their swords strapped on their side. So something changed. They were fighting with the sword, which we could see is the word of God. And they were building at the same time. What happened? They remembered how great God was. They remembered who they and what they were fighting for. They were fighting for Keats, just so you know. They're fighting for keys. In chapter 5, he rebuked the nobles, and they got on board. And then in chapter 6, verse 15, and so the wall was completed in 52 days. God will do in, I think it's interesting, 52 days. Just... 52 weeks in a year, but 52 days. That's amazing. One seventh of, of a year, just 52 days, he rebuilt the wall. That's a powerful thing. That's a powerful thing. Who did it? The Lord rebuilt the wall. That end of that verse said, The Lord rebuilt the wall. 52 days. Could you stand for 52 days? Could you stand a little bit longer? How am I doing? Well, when you have opportunity, do good, especially to the household of faith. Here's what I'm asking you this. I'm asking, will you stand next to me? You want to stand this morning? Will you stand next to me? Will you stand next to me with your, with your sword drawn or on your side? And will you build a wall? Will you, where you see the wall falling down? Listen, Joe, you see a wall falling down someplace that I don't, I don't live. If you were to read chapter three, some people, it was right in front of their house. It says they stayed at their house and they built the wall right across from their house because it was right in their neighborhood. It was right in their close peak, right, right there. And they st- stood there and they, and they, st- and the other people, they went down all the way over here and they built a long ways, 1200 feet. Where, where's the wall broken? Where do you know the wall's broken? I just want us to just, just 
right now, I want us just to cut, close our eyes. I want you to ask the Lord where the wall is broken. Where is the wall broken? And you're gonna find that the Lord will bring to you a name of a person or a family or a situation. And I want you right now, I want you to make note of that. Not just to pray right now, but until the wall is built. Until the wall is built. Who is the, and you know, it was some places the wall, the hole was built, and there was three, four, five, six families that worked on that section of that wall. Who are those people? And then I challenge you this, to pray what God says. Pray the word of God, but pray what God says. Do you know Ephesians chapter one and chapter three where Paul prays for the church at Ephesus? Those were God-inspired words for that church. You know there's God-inspired words for that wall that needs to be rebuilt. There's God-inspired words. Lord, what do you say? And pray a prayer. Son, stand still. Pray a prayer that seems bigger, that's unreasonable. Here on this earth, plant, release the word of God. Partner with what he says. And watch the heart of the Father of restoration and a wall built and the robbers, where the robbers and the thieves and the foxes can't come in to steal. Stand on the wall and watch. Fill the gap so the building can continue. Stand next to me, stand next to them. Go, go talk to your friend that you know you've already talked to because you had this person on your heart. Now you go together, go with them. Covenant with them. Father, thank you today for your words to us. Thank you for your family. I thank you for working in these hearts, in my heart a knitting of family, that we wouldn't just come in and go out, but that there would be connection and that we would make connection and we would see one another as our own. And Father, thank you for your words. To show us who and how and what to pray. Lord, we just say, just as we started it this morning, all of me for all of you. And I thank you that your hands are not shortened. But we are your hands and we are your feet. We go where you send us. Here we are, Lord, send me. Here I am, send me. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I want to close with this. I would say this. If you got a hole in your wall, if you got a hole in your wall where things have been, been breaking in, don't be afraid to ask, ask somebody to help you build the wall. Don't be afraid to ask somebody to help you Ask your brothers and your sisters to help you build a wall because you're family. Amen. This is like, this is, if there's need, don't be afraid to ask to help build a wall because there's more than just you and you have people that care. You got a family. You got a family. And we say that all the time. When we come in, when we go out, so many times we think that like, my problems don't matter. These things don't matter. They do matter. They matter to God. And they matter to His people. Amen.